Hey, well, my name is Pastor Zach. I'm, I'm excited for today's message, week two of our dream series. I, I, I do have a few housekeeping things that I want to talk about. And, and the first one is this, December the 26th. December the 26th, that's a Sunday. The last Sunday of the year, we have uh, what we call our at-home service. And what does this look like? Everybody go ahead and grab your little presents that you got when you walked in, in the room. Everybody got one. If you didn't get one, raise your hand, and some of our ushers will get them to you. But they look like this. Hey, can we give it up to the people that package these? That's great, right? So go ahead and go ahead and open those up. You can kind of peek inside. Here's the deal. I saw some of you already open. Like, you were walking in. Like, what in the world? Like, you were the people that try to open your Christmas presents before Christmas. How many people shake Christmas boxes to try to guess what's in them? Do you ever really guess what's in them? Because I... Yeah, she's like, yes, you have a gift. I like pick it up. I'm like, I don't want my, so the older I get, I used to want to open up my presents like three weeks before Christmas. And now I just want to wait. And now my daughter's asking, do we get to open them today? Do we get to open them? No, you got to wait. Can we open them today? No, not today. So, so I, I see who likes to open their presents before Christmas. But our at-home service, what does that look like? The team has already recorded our Christmas service for December the 26th. Here's, here's the challenge. We know that many of you travel for Christmas. We know that you're going to to visit family. We like to visit our family too. And and we just want to hang out with our our families at Christmas. But but what we also, amen, right? But what we also want to do is we also want to share Jesus with people. This is what I think the modern church, the 21st century has done. They bring people, or what the community has done. They bring people to church and rely on the church to talk about Jesus for them. They'll invite their family members to church and rely on the church to talk to their family members about Jesus, opposed to them opening up their mouths about Jesus to their own family. I told the team this today or earlier this morning, I lived that way for the first, well, probably from 15 to about 29. I relied on the the churches in the areas that my parents lived in, the separate areas that they lived in. I relied on those churches to talk to my family about Jesus because it wasn't something that could come from me. Can can I be honest with you? It didn't work. Can can I be honest with you? I had to open up my mouth. So why do we do the at-home service? Why why do we give you coffee? Why do we give you hot chocolate? Listen, listen, sit down with your families and talk to them about Jesus. We've prepared about a 15-minute sort of devotional for you to walk through with your family. This is what what I want to do as a pastor. I want to put ownership back on families when it comes to talking about Jesus in the home. I want to put ownership on the parents. I want to put ownership on the spouses. I want to put ownership that you would talk about Jesus in your home. What better season to do it in than that of Christmas? So that's why we give you the gifts. That's why we do our at-home service at the end of the year. So as you travel, as you're meeting with your family, pull it up on your phone. Pull it up on your iPad. Throw it on your TV. Make a cup of coffee. Make a cup of hot chocolate and talk to your family about Jesus. After service today... We also have our party with the pastors. What does that mean? That means we're going to kind of go through our growth track. We have 16 individuals that are already signed up for party with the pastors. It's right after service today. It's going to be about 45 minutes. We're going to meet in the first two rows. If you haven't signed up and you're new to the church, and if you want to be a part of it, come hang out with us. We're going to be here for about 45 minutes. Uh, I got to give you one other thing. This is this is pretty cool too. One other thing that that I wanted to man. I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. A few weeks ago, we took our miracle offering. It's got that uh, kind of miracle offering that we take at the end of the year. And because of that, and because of Kingdom Builders, from the miracle offering, we were able to help seven families from the CrossFit 926 Angel Tree. Jake, how how many families did the gym help out overall? Do you know round about off the top of your head? A hundred different families. Uh, and, and the church was, uh, you can clap for that, the, the, church, the church was able to help out seven of, of those families. I got a message from uh, Mary Rose Rafferty, and she said that she was just thankful to be a part of a church that's making an impact in the community. Because this is what happened. Can I give you the practicals? What happened? We took a miracle offering, and we were able to help several different families, and there's some more stuff that I'll share. But then Brittany got a team of about, what, 10 people together? And, and after service, you guys went shopping for those seven different families, and the church truly played an impact and made an impact in having Christmas for families that otherwise might not have. We were also able to give $5,000 to Get Strong Ministries. That's the organization that we're partnering with in Nicaragua, looking at planning a church there starting next year. Several families inside of our own church we were able to help out. 
And we were able to, to uh, partner with the Fair family who wrote Christmas in Uganda. Listen, if you're a kid, I'll mention this in the service a little later today. If you have a kid that's in kids' church right now, you're getting one of these to take home. It's a story. Go ahead. It's a story for you. It's like, well, do we clap? I don't know. No. But it's a story for you to be able to share the, the Christmas message with your kids, to truly talk about Jesus in a unique way. So we're excited to give you guys that there's also two other people in the room that we need to celebrate. Many of you have seen them throughout the past semester. You, you've seen them walking around. You've seen everything that they do. They're kind of looking at each other right now like, are they talking about us? Yeah, I'm talking about you guys. So Peyton and Mary, could you guys make your way to the stage? Can we give it up for Peyton and Mary? Go ahead and come all the way up here, ladies. You can step up there. here. I'll help you step up here if you want to. Boom. You got it? You got it? Boom, boom. Y'all stand over there. Jenna and Brittany, if you guys could bring them their gifts. This is what, this is what you don't, might not know about these ladies. All, all the stuff that's packaged and pretty, <laughs> all the globes and, and all the stuff that we put in the chairs, these two ladies had a major role in, in putting that stuff together, but, but they also help set up the church every single Sunday. They also serve at every single event that we have, whether it be Christmas in Davidson, whether it be tailgate events, and, and Peyton and Mary, there, there have been a lot of practicum students, um, and I've seen the ebbs and flows of practicum students that, that we've had. Mary, you have been with us, I feel like, for 15 years, but you, you've been with us since we started the church. Like, you're one of the OGs, and to see you grow and mature and to step into God's calling. We had a meeting uh, earlier this week, and I won't share, you know, what we talked about, but there truly is a call of God on your life. And you're truly going to make an impact. All you got to do is keep dreaming and keep going forward. And, and then Peyton, um, brass tacks, you were like, I don't know what I signed up for. And now, now I'm driving all the way out to Lake Norman a couple times a week. And, and to, see, to see your attitude change over the past semester, you know, you've stepped in. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, I don't really know if I want to do this. But to watch you just to jump in with, with both feet. And to be a part of this community, you truly have made our community better. So could you give it up for Peyton and Mary one time as they wrap up? Give me a hug, ladies. Thank you guys so much for all that you do. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Why, why do we do that? Man, I just want to celebrate people. I, I want to I celebrate individuals who are truly making an impact in our community. So here we go, week two of our dream series. And if I had to title this something, I would title it Making Others' Dreams Come True. Making other dreams come true. So let, let's talk about this just a little bit. I'm going to pick on a few people in the room because I know your stories. And Jake and Zach, I feel like I'm always picking on you now because you're here. But I'm going to continue to pick on you, right? So, so think about, where are you over here? Think about CrossFit 926, right? It, it started out as a dream. It started out as an idea. And you guys kind of got together, and, and your families got together, and, and I guarantee you that your wives challenged you to chase that dream. I, I guarantee you that your wives challenged you to, to go down that path, and because people poured into your life along the way, a dream is now a reality. Brian and Jacqueline, are you guys in here? I saw you walk in this morning. So I, I know a little bit about your story, and, and I know you're, you've started a business. You started multiple businesses. And, and there's people that have poured into you along the way and said, you know what, I think you guys can do this. And they've, they've kind of pulled those dreams out of you, and now those dreams are becoming a reality. I know Megan has a, her own business, and many of you guys see Megan running around, but Megan's dreams are now a reality. Paul and Nicole, like phenomenal worship pastors. You're like, we want to start something. Let's start making earrings. And then the dream slowly became a reality. And you're like, now I'm making all kinds of earrings. I don't know. But dreams become realities. Jenna, I know when we first started dating, I, I remember talking to you about bakeries. It was like what we talked about. It's like your love language was making me bake items. And I loved it. And then I started gaining weight. And I didn't like it. <laughs> but I saw a dream become a reality. And I saw you step out of your shell, and I saw you working for other people, and you would come home like, I can, I can do this. And then we would move, and you would work for another bakery, and, and you would come home, and you would say, man, I, I can do this. And then when we moved to Charlotte, you said, you know what, I'm, I'm going 
to do this. And, and now you have a successful business and you own your own bakery. But I know that people poured into you along the way and your dreams have now become a reality. Th there's many of you in the room that, that you have dreams inside of you and they've become realities because people have pulled them out of you and coached you along the way. As a church, what's one of our dreams? We're, we're planning a church and a coffee shop in Hickory, North Carolina next year. Dreams are now becoming reality. Something that was once a dream is now a reality because other people believed in you, encouraged you, and saw something inside of you. Inevitably, what happens? Someone helped you facilitate your dream. Someone helped you facilitate your dream. And Scripture tells us that Joseph had a dream. But Joseph's dream was to facilitate Mary's dream. See, it's cool when your dreams come to pass. It's cool when, when you make it. But I think one of, one of the best things that you can experience in life is helping other people's dreams come true. It's championing someone else. It's being in the corner of someone else and saying, hey, I see greatness inside of you. And I, I see that God has a dream inside of you. And beginning to pull that out of other people people. See, last week we talked about the dreams that are inside of you. And this week I want to talk about the dreams that are inside of others and how we're called to help pull those God-given dreams out of other people. So, so how do we become a Joseph? How do we become a person that makes those around us better? A few weeks back, I asked you if you wanted to be a consumer or a multiplier. See, consumers get people's half effort. And if you grew up in the South and you had a dad like I did, that was called half something else. And I'll let you fill in the blank. But, but what do multipliers do? Multipliers get two times out of individuals. Now, now think about this in sports. I love sports. You're going to get a lot of sports analogies if you come to this church. I apologize, but I love sports. I love looking at Any other stat people in the room? Like, I just love looking at stats. I appreciate you. I love looking at stats. And one of the stats that I look at is, is how does an individual make their team better? And there's a few people in the, sport, in the history of sports that were just great at this. One of them is Magic Johnson. Sh Showtime Lakers. But Magic Johnson, he was a great athlete. He was a great basketball player. But he had the tendency that he would pull out greatness in others. Another one that I hate to admit, Tom Brady. Like, like I hate to admit it. But Tom Brady makes his teams better. See, we used to think it was Belichick and Brady, and then Brady made a bounce to the Bucks, And now all of a sudden we realize that Brady truly is great, and he truly makes the people around him better. He pulls out the greatness in other people. Another person in basketball that's doing it all too well right now, Steph Curry. Like I don't know if you follow basketball at all, but Steph Curry makes his team better. I watched a video this past week, Coach Kerr. That's the, the coach for Golden State Warriors. He was sitting on the bench beside Curry, and Curry's head was kind of down. He was having a rough night. He, he just wasn't shooting well, and, and what, did, what did Coach Curry do? He pulled out the stat sheet, and, and he showed Curry. He said, listen, you're not shooting well. I see that, but you're a sister up, and, and the plus minus when you're on the court, everyone else is scoring. Everyone else is moving the ball when you're on the court. I know you're having a rough night, but the team is better because you're on the court. You're pulling out greatness in others. You're pulling out greatness. I want to be that type of person. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we're starting in verse 18. Let me read this to you. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. In a what? In a dream. We're in our dream series, right? In a dream. And said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, very important verse, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home to be his wife. 
but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. See, see, this is what I want to talk about today, that every Mary needs a Joseph. Now, hear me. I'm not saying everybody needs a man, all right? But, but I'm saying every dreamer needs someone in their corner, someone that will absolutely pull out the best in them. Who is it for you? I, I remember being in, in boot camp and uh, at, at, in the Marine Corps, and, and at boot camp, we would learn about all these Marines that had kind of come before us. And one of the individuals that we learned about was Lieutenant General Lewis Chesty Puller. And he went by the name Chesty because of all the ribbons he carried on his chest. The joke was it actually weighed his uniform down. He had so many ribbons on his chest. And he made comments like this. He would say something like this, hit him hard, hit him fast, and hit him often. He was someone that, that was a no-nonsense type of person. But when the enemy was coming, he would say, hit him hard, hit him fast, and hit him often. See, I need someone in my corner who's like that when it comes to my dreams. I need someone who's challenging me to hit my dreams hard, to hit them fast, and to hit them often. One of my favorite quotes from Chesty was this. He was in the Korean War, and Puller told his men as they were surrounded, all right, men, they're on your left, they're on your right, they're in front of us, and they're behind us. They can't get away this time. Some of y'all will catch that like ne next week. But, but I love that about who Chesty Puller was. They were surrounded by the enemy, and his response was, good, they can't get away. I, I need people like that in my life when it seems like life isn't going my way. When there's a little bit of confusion and there's a little bit of chaos, I need someone in my corner that says, good, you're right where you need to be. That's ultimately what Joseph did to Mary. Could you imagine what Mary's feeling as she's pregnant with child? Sure, it's from the Holy Spirit, but I guarantee you she started thinking about society. I guarantee you she started thinking about what in the world are people going to think. And then Joseph stepped in her corner and said, hey, guess what? We're right where we need to be. That's the type of person that I want to be. I want to pull the very best out of people. Who is it for you? I'll ask you again. Think about your life. Who's the coach? Who's the teacher? Who's the coworker? Who's the boss? For me, I mean, the first one that I could really think of outside of family was, was a lady named Miss Lindman. She was my journalism teacher all the way through high school. My high school years were up and down. I was all over the place. But she had something about her that would just pull out the best in me. When I was in college, it was Chris Owen and Charlie Dawes. They had a tendency to just pull the best out of me when I was in the Marine Corps. First one was Sergeant Butler. I remember standing in front of Sergeant Butler on the parade deck, and I'm standing at attention, and I'm holding my hand out to receive my Eagle Globe and Anchor. We had just finished the crucible. And he places that Eagle Globe and Anchor in my hand, and it was the first time that he didn't call me recruit, that he called me private first class whip, and he looked me in the eye. And he said, Private First Class Whip, be a better leader than I am. He closed my hand, said, aye, sir, and he walked away. But those words have stuck with me my entire life. He had this way of pulling the best out of me. The second one was Gunny Sergeant Durden, my first duty station. And he just had this tendency to pull the best out of Marines. I, I want to be that type of person. So who's in your corner? Who's pulling the best out of you? Who's done it in the past? See, see if, we're not, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, if we start, start to look back on our past, some of you will start making excuses. Some of you will start saying something along the lines of, well, no one's ever been in my corner. Some of you will say, well, I had a hard life. I had to, I had to figure it out on my own. And, and can I just, for a moment, just call BS? Like, like, as your pastor, can I say that's nonsense? As your pastor, can I remind everyone in the room that there's nobody in this room that's good enough to have gotten where you are in life without someone in your corner pointing you in the right direction? We've all had someone, right? 
We've all had a teacher. We've all had the co-worker. We've all had the boss. Sure, we have the negative, but we have someone that has pointed us in the right direction. Don't have this woe is me attitude. In fact, if we start having this woe is me attitude, we start to turn this sermon into something that it's not supposed to be. Because I don't want to get it twisted. This message isn't about how your dreams are coming true. We have to flip the script. This message is whose dreams are you making come true? Who are you fighting for? Don't always act like Mary. You're not always Mary in the story. Sometimes you're called to be Joseph. Sure, you have dreams that are inside of you. Sure, you want to see those dreams come to pass. But sometimes your role is to facilitate other individuals' dreams. Sometimes you're called to be a Joseph. Do people even know that you're in their corner? Or, or do you just kind of cheer them on from a distance saying, I hope they figure it out. I, I, I hope they make it. Or, or do they see you in their corner? T- take a deeper look at the scripture. If you're in someone's corner, if you truly want to make their dreams come true, if you're taking notes, remember we're a note-taking church, so pull out your phones, pull out your notebooks. Number one is this. They have to know that you care about them. Verse 20 says this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Well, pastor, you you just said the first point was they have to know that you care about them. Why did you pick verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife? Well, Well, let's look at it in its cultural context. See, culturally, this would have been unacceptable. Culturally, their families would have been ostracized. Culturally, if Mary was already pregnant and Joseph said, hey, come and be my wife anyway, they would be shut out by the rest of society. In fact, society would have said that Joseph had the right to pull her into the town square and let everyone know that she was pregnant. But Joseph says, no, 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 no. I I care for this woman. And I want to see the God's dream that is inside of her. I want to see it come to pass. And my role is to facilitate this dream. It's the old adage that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People, people don't want to hear your two cents unless they know you care about them. And sometimes for, for some reason, we think that to get the best out of people, you can't show weakness, you can't show approval, and that you have to come down with an iron fist. But I've come to find out that people thrive in a culture of permission. Individuals thrive in a culture where they can make mistakes. They thrive in a culture where they know they are loved and cared for. Now hear me, sometimes it's tough love. But, but for Joseph, he cared for Mary, regardless, regardless of what would come their way. What did he say? He said, I'm going to stand beside her and I'm going to stay committed to Mary. Why? Because he recognized the dream that God had placed inside of her. Do you truly recognize the dream that God has placed inside of people? So point two, recognize that God has placed, recognize what God has placed within them. The second part of verse 20, what is conceived in her, in Mary, is from the Holy Spirit. You have to see past the junk, see past what society would say, and see the true value. See, society would have told Joseph to drag Mary into the center of the town and say, hey, look at this woman. She's pregnant and it's not mine. But Joseph saw past what society would say. And he saw the true value that Mary was carrying. You guys ever meet somebody for the first time and they start to tell you their story? And they kind of get a little shameful when they tell you parts of their story. See, I I love hearing people's story for the first time. I, I love hearing the shameful parts of people's story. I love hearing the parts that people try to hide in their closet. Why? Because I believe in a redemptive God. I, I believe that God can make something that looked dark, that looked broken, that looked like a mess, and, and he can make a dream come out of it. He can make something new out of it. Why? Because our God is a redemptive God. And I don't know about you, but I experienced it firsthand. 
I'm thankful, I'm thankful for that kind of God. We have to look past the junk and see something's true value. In 1799, Conrad Reed was the son of a, of a farmer and fo- former Hessian soldier, John Reed. And they found this 17-pound rock on their land. And, and that rock, the way they described it, they said, it's a yellow-looking rock and it looks a little funny, but we'll keep it anyway. By the way, this happened in Cabarrus County, right down the street. And for three years, this rock served as this bulky doorstop until 1802. And a jeweler from Fayetteville was coming through town, and he happened to see this 17-pound doorstop, and he looked at it, and he said, that's pure gold. He said, John Reed, name, name your price. I'll pay whatever you want. And John Reed looked at the doorstop, and he thought a fair price was a week's worth of wages at a hefty $3.50. Come to find out that 17-pound gold rock at the time was worth $3,500. Today, it would be worth $365,000. But John Reed didn't know the value of the rock. He just sold it off for what he thought was fair. How many of us are walking around just selling off our dreams for what we think is a fair wage, what we think is a fair price? I'll give up on the dream that God has put inside of me and I'll take the paycheck. I'll give up on the calling that God has placed inside of me and I'll just live comfortable. I'll give up on on where God has called me to go and I'll, I'll just sell it off for whatever I can get for it. And we wonder why we live empty lives. See, the majority of people in the world don't realize what's inside of them. Remember a few weeks ago when I had the mirrors up and I I sat in the chair and I was facing the mirror and I said something along the lines of this. We have the tendency to see fear when we look in the the mirror. We can see failure when we look in the mirror. We can see inadequacy when we look in the mirror. We can see mistakes that we made in our past. We can see our family tree and our heritage and our genealogy and what we came from when we looked in the mirror. If we're not careful, we can see our lack when we look in the mirror. If we're not careful, we can see an empty bank account when we look in the mirror. Like If if we're not careful, what we can see is where we fall short. But can I... Tell somebody that I truly believe that when God looks at you, he sees hope. He sees a redemptive story. He sees calling, and he sees divine design. And as I look across, I know, I know most of your stories. And when I look out, I see hope. I see calling. And I see divine design. But you know what breaks my heart? I can also look in your eyes, and I can also hear some of your words, and you don't see it in yourself. I truly believe that my assignment today is to make you remember some of the dreams that God has placed inside of you. For me to be in your corner. Maybe in this moment I could be your Joseph. Maybe in this moment there's some dreams that were once inside of you are starting to bubble back up. And once you recognize what God, God has placed in individuals, number three is this, help others give birth to their God dream. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son. Are you willing to help others' dreams be fulfilled even if yours don't work out? I truly wrestle with that question. Are, are you willing to help people pull their God-given dream out of them even if your dreams don't come to pass. In professional sports, teams will bring veterans on the team to pull out in the best in others because they have the reps. They, they've been there before. And I read this story, read a little article this past week. It wasn't a long article. It was probably like 500 words. I'm not that smart. I can't read more than that. But, but I, read, I read this article, and it was about Tom Brady. That's why I threw Brady into this message. A- anybody see the message or the, uh, the article about Brady and his cold weather surfing gear that he would wear you saw that so so for those who don't know Tom Brady when he played for the Patriots it was always cold right so he's playing in Gillette Stadium snowing all the time what he would do is he would wear a cold weather surf suit to play the games that's how he stayed warm during the games 
So he passed that trick of the trade down to Brian Hoyer, and then Hoyer passed it down to the current quarterback for the Patriots, Mac Jones. So this past weekend, Mac Jones was wearing this cold weather surf suit. If I was at it, like, Mac, where'd you, where'd you get that idea? What well, was passed down? Why? We already know this about Brady. Brady just wanted to pull greatness out in others. That's why he passed it down to Hoyer. And then Hoyer passed it down to Mac Jones. And I guarantee you that Brady wasn't thinking that he was giving tricks of the trade or secrets to somebody that was going to replace him. He wasn't worried about it. He just wanted to pull out the best in others. See, if we're not careful, we don't want to pull out dreams in other people because we think they can somehow surpass our dreams. Or they can surpass us. Brady wasn't worried about it. Brady wasn't worried that, that the guy that would replace him would know his secret. Brady just wanted to make other people better. Are you willing to pull out the dreams in others? Once you help others give birth to their God-given dream, always remember to speak life in accordance to what God is speaking. The second part of verse 21, and you are to give him the name Jesus. See, if we're not careful, when we start to talk to people about their dreams, we want to reflect what's inside of us on them. I, I can hear, if I'm not careful, I can hear your dream and then I can start adding my, my dreams to it. But that's, that's not what scripture tells us to do. Joseph wasn't there to facilitate Mary's dream and to facilitate God's dream so that he could name it what he wanted to name it. The angel of the Lord said, Joseph, you're going to name the baby Jesus. And Joseph said, all right, that's my role. I'm going to facilitate this thing. God, I'll, I'll call it whatever you want me to call it. I, I don't need to rename something that you've already created. As you pull dreams out in other people, be careful, be careful not to name it what you want to name it. Be careful not to shift the conversation to where you want it to go. As you pull the dreams out of other people, be careful to name the dream what God has already named the dream. Nicole, you put a post up on social media, on Instagram this past week. And I, I want to read it so I don't mess it up. But, but the post said this, no one else is supposed to understand your calling. It wasn't a conference call. Yeesh. Like that, that'll make you think. Because what I know to be true is that there's negative people in life. What I know to be true is that there's people that want to steal your dream. What I know to be true is that there's individuals that are in your life that don't want you to succeed. What I know to be true is that there's trolls in your life. But we have the option to either listen to the voices or not listen to the voices. It's nonsense. Could, could you imagine this for just a second? My daughter, Harlow, well, not Harlow, Harlow likes to dance too. I'm already mixing them up. Anybody have multiple kids and mix them up? I'm there. My daughter, Piper, she loves to dance. Like, if you know Piper, you know that she loves to dance. We're at the house. If there's not music on, Daddy, will you play music? I want to dance. I want to put on a dress and dance. That's what she, I just want to put on a dress and dance. She dances around the house. We're in the car, she's dancing. Daddy, turn the music up louder. She's going to have hearing problems when she's older because we crank it. We're like the annoying car in the school line, like waiting to drop her off at school. Windows roll down. My daughter's like literally standing outside the sunroof dancing. Like, that's what she does. She dances. If you were at downtown Davidson, there was music outside. The girl was just dancing everywhere. She loves to dance. She, she, I, I feel like she dreams about dancing and for a for a moment could you imagine this for a second could you imagine if someone went up to my four-year-old daughter and they told her that she wasn't good at dancing to stop dancing her dream is to dance and could you imagine if someone walked up to my four-year-old daughter and said piper that's the dumbest idea ever you should stop dancing could, could you imagine for a moment if someone walked up to my four-year-old daughter and they told, they told her, they said, Piper, stop dancing because you'll never make it in life dancing. 
could you imagine if someone walked up to, I'm getting angry right now, like thinking about this, but could someone imagine if somebody walked up to my four-year-old daughter and said, Piper, you're not good enough to dance because nobody in your family dances the way that you want to dance. There's two things that would happen very, very quickly. One, that person needs to start praying they have good health insurance. Two, I'm calling some of y'all to bail me out of jail. Three, y'all probably need to look for another pastor. All right. But I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. We would never do that to a four-year-old. We would never crush someone's dream like that. We would never allow those voices to speak into their life. So why are you allowing those voices in your life? Can I get base level? Can I like, can I get down in the junk for a second? Hey, can you, can we all, myself included, can we all check our own lives? Have we been that voice to other people unintentionally? Have, have we unintentionally been that negative voice in someone else's life? I don't, I don't need that type of, I don't need that type of energy in my life. I don't need that type of person in my life. I don't need those type of voices in my life. Nor do you need to be that type of voice in somebody's life. This is the type of voice that we need in our life. That's the type of voice we need in our life. Luke's like burying his head right now. Come on, Luke. That's where you get loud again. If you're going to be that loud in the gym, you better be that loud in the church. But, but seriously, it's like we can get spiritual, and it's, it's okay to get excited. I need that type of voice in my life. Those type of voices pull out greatness in me. They pull out something in me that I couldn't pull out myself. Here's the reality. I'm wearing, wearing Brandy's belt, who was, was like 10 times too small, sucking in, I'm like, trying to press Brandy's bar, and then all of a sudden, Luke from left field is just like, need it! But if Luke wouldn't have done that, I guarantee you I wouldn't have lifted that weight. I know it didn't look like a lot. It's a strict press, all right? It ain't supposed to be that much weight. <laughs> Easy. But, but seriously, I, I, Luke, I needed that. We, we need that in our life. And if you need it, someone else needs it. Why don't you be that voice in someone else's life? Why don't you help facilitate other people's dreams? Mary was carrying the dream. Joseph's role was to facilitate the dream. We all have dreams. That's okay. That's good. But help facilitate someone else's dream. Go ahead and go to that, go to that picture. Just go to the picture. Look at Luke's face. Like he's just, like he was more excited than I was. That's why you won the superlative last night, Luke. But Mary needed Joseph's voice in her life. Why? Verse 22, this is where it all comes together. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. Let, let, me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you. Will your word and your actions towards others call people into their God-given dreams or push them away? What are your words and your actions causing other people to do? Are they pulling out the best of people or are they pushing them away from their God-given dream? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Who's the person that you're going to help their God-given dream come true through your words and through your actions. I, I truly pray that God places someone in your heart and in your mind, even, even right now. Maybe it's a coworker, Maybe it's a sibling. Hey, maybe it's your spouse. Maybe you see dreams inside of your spouse and and you've just been kind of watching them manifest inside of them, what if you start pulling, pulling those dreams out? What if you start challenging your spouse to chase their dreams? Hey, maybe, maybe it's your kids. 
Maybe you're at a season in your life where you see your kids chasing dreams. What if you're that still small voice that just affirms their dreams? Because mom and dad, I promise, I promise that's the voice they want to hear. I promise that's the, that's the affirmation that they want to hear. I, I can only imagine that the only, the only person that Mary wanted to hear from was Joseph. Why? Because he was the closest to her. It, it's who she loved. We don't hear mention of, of Mary's family. We don't hear mention of Joseph's family much. But what we hear is that, that Mary and Joseph were, they loved each other. They were one together. And I can just imagine that Mary wanted to hear Joseph's voice. Who is the loved one that you need to pour into? Because all they want to hear is your voice. They can say, hey, mom and dad, I'm dreaming, but can you just, can you just let me know I'm going the right direction? Can, can you just let me know I'm on the right track? Hey, what if, it's, what if it's one of your best friends? What if it's being part of Multiply Church to make God's dream of reaching Lake Norman a reality? Don't leave here being a consumer. God's called us to be multipliers. He's called us to pour in to other individuals and to pull out greatness. And and maybe, maybe you'd say something along the lines of, hey, Zach, it's it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to dream because I feel like there's a void. It's hard for me to dream because I feel like there's, there's emptiness. It's hard for me to dream because I feel like there's nothing there. What if, what if that void, I don't know, but what if that void is a relationship with Jesus? Maybe you're not fully connecting to dreams because you're not connected to the person who gives you the dreams. On the count of three, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. And if you would say, Pastor, man, that's me. I just need to step into a relationship with Jesus. And then we're going to say a prayer together. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm just going to say a prayer collectively. If that's you all across this room, you say, Pastor, I just, I need to step into a relationship with Jesus. I need to be connected to the person who gives dreams. On the count of three, all across this room, ready? One, two, three. If that's you. And then if we could just say this prayer together, can we say, Jesus? Forgive me of my sins. I need you in my life. Help me to dream. Help me to understand the divine design that you've placed inside of me. Help me to live wide awake to your love and fully alive to my purpose. It's in your name I pray. Hey, listen, if you said that prayer for the very first time, or maybe it was a rededication of your life to Jesus, right outside of these doors to the left, we have what we call our wide awake and fully alive area. Becoming wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to his purpose for your life. We'll have some individuals there that will talk to you. We we believe that the prayer and stepping into a relationship with Jesus is the most important decision you can ever make in your entire life, but it's just the beginning. Doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. Doesn't mean life's always going to be easy. But it means you have someone that will walk with you day in and day out. And his name is Jesus. Church, can we give it up for the people who just stepped into a relationship with Jesus? All right, listen. You've got your gifts. I want you to go ahead and start planning who you're going to have church with at your house. All right? Don't forget, party with the pastors right after service if you're part of those 16 or so people. Or if you want to stay and you didn't sign up, come to the front two rows. But we'll see you next week as we continue to love Jesus and change the world. See you guys next week.